Hi, welcome to Spies and Spy Masters Happy Hour, a drink with Winston Churchill. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Our speaker this evening is the incoming Spy Museum historian curator, Dr. Andrew Hammond. So before we get to Andrew and before we get to Winston Churchill, let's head over to Free State in the Gallery Place, Penn Quarter neighborhood and Jasmine, what are you mixing up for us this evening? Hi, y'all. So I'm at Free State right now, and I'm going to be making a blood, toil, sweat, and tears. So what you're going to do is grab your tin to start, and we're going to add some ice. Once you add some ice, we can add an ounce and a half of chacho. So chacho is a jalapeno-based liqueur. It's absolutely delicious. It's local in D.C. I use it in all my citrus cocktails just to add a little bit of heat. <laughs> So then we're going to add three ounces of tomato juice, half an ounce of lemon, a little dash of pepper, dash of Worcester sauce, awesome, and then we're going to shake this on up. Oh yeah, I like that. <laughs> All right, so after we're done shaking it, before we even pour it into our glass, we're going to grab our glass. Put the rim in some lemon or any citrus that you have and then put it in some salt so you have like a nice salted rim like you see here then we're going to want to pour all of that in there perfect oh my oh my gosh <laughs> jasmine <laughs> we're just going to garnish with some lemon i like to put olives in mine oh oh i want the olives oh my gosh <laughs> cheers Cheers, yeah. And if you don't have um, chacho, you can always use vodka. That would be a great replacement as well. Um, we're using Civic Vodka. It's a uh, Republic Restoratives, a woman-owned distillery in D.C. So, yeah, enjoy y'all. Cheers. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. That looks wonderful. <laughs> Cheers to you. And Free State is open, Gallery Place, Penn Quarter neighborhood for outdoor drinks, right? Yes, outdoor drinks. Well, thanks, Ben. You take care. Thanks for being here tonight. All right, now over to Dr. Andrew Hammond. Hi, welcome aboard, Andrew. Um, Andrew's you. coming to us from the Library of Congress where he was a fellow at the Kluge Center working on a project that aims to tell the story of 9-11 and the war on terror through the stories of military and intelligence veterans. His interest in these areas comes from a period of service in the Royal Air Force, including several years with the G2 intelligence section, where he worked on photon and secondments, which I really love saying, to the British Army and Royal Navy. Andrew is the author of a forthcoming book, Struggles for Freedom, Afghanistan and US Foreign Policy since 1979. That will be published next year but tonight he's talking to us about Winston Churchill. All right, over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Amanda, uh, and thanks for your kind words in the introduction. Um, I should say that I am not uh, drinking any liquor at the moment. I'm drinking beer um, because the liquor is for after the event with uh, a cigar, and this is a... Uh, uh, cigar that is Churchill's favorite brand, uh, Romeo and Julieta, um, a habit that he picked up when he was in Cuba in 1895. So that's for, that's for afterwards. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just talk for the next 25 minutes or so about Churchill as a user of secret intelligence. So, we see Churchill quite a lot in the news at the moment. We hear about his words. We hear about his leadership. We even hear about his alcohol consumption. So you can see his favorite brand of scotch there, Johnny Walker Red. Um, what we don't hear a lot about is Churchill as a user of secret intelligence. And he was arguably one of the greatest users of intelligence in the 20th century. So we're looking back at Churchill's career and life, focusing on the Second World War, and we're thinking about what can 
the 20th century's uh, preeminent user of intelligence, or at least one of them, what can he tell us or how can he inform where we are at the moment with regards to what's going on in the world and specifically the world of intelligence? So a good example would be um, The Darkest Hour. So uh, for those of you that haven't seen this movie, it's a really great movie. Um, so we see Gary Oldman here playing Churchill. Um, he knocks it out of the park. He wins an Oscar. But apart from a couple of minor um, mentions, you don't really hear much about secret intelligence, about intelligence. Because Churchill was a, was a, a, a a big lover of. Okay, so before we go on to look at Churchill's a user of intelligence, just a really brief um, little bit more of information about me as the new incoming historian curator at the International Spy Museum. So as Amanda said, um, in a former life, I was in the Royal Air Force. Um, what you see at the moment is um, the, a castle that's nearby where I grew up, just on the outskirts of Glasgow. So this is Bothell Castle. And what's interesting about that is that it quite often changed hands in the 13th century wars of Scottish independence as a result of spying, of espionage. So spying is certainly something that's been around uh, since time immemorial. Um, this is uh, a photograph of my youngest niece. So when I was in the Air Force, I was in the photographic branch. So I enjoyed uh, taking photographs. Uh, this is my favorite cocktail here, a rusty nail. So basically it's very simple, Drambuie and a, and a deluxe scotch like Johnny Walker or J&B. Um, the heat and the sweetness balance off each other. It's a fantastic cocktail. Um, and on the bottom left, um, this is from the, the game last year where the Washington Nationals won the pennant. Um, and you'll forgive the blurriness of the image because I was trying to do Baby Shark at the same time as taking a photograph. Um, and for anybody that's into baseball, you will probably recall that the Houston Astros had a, an intelligence and espionage operation of which the KGB would probably have been proud. Um, okay, so enough about me. Back on the church. The KGB would not have been caught. <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so on to Churchill. So this is from the International Churchill Society. So this is this is very recent. So the coronavirus threatens the entire world. The closest historic an analogy is the Second World War. It is therefore no surprise, many people are looking to the inspira inspiring wartime leadership of Winston Churchill. So we could say that they're biased. Let's, let's look if Churchill is actually part of the popular conversation. Okay, so at the top here, we see Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York. Winston Churchill is a hero of mine, he said, this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So this is in April, this is when New York was getting, um, was really struggling with the coronavirus. And in that same month, another state that was really struggling with the coronavirus, New Jersey, uh, this is Governor Phil Murphy. If I could get even a speck of fingernail of lessons channeled out of what Winston Churchill did as a leader, I thought that I'd be a better leader. Okay, so we see these two democratic governors refer to Churchill, but it's far from being um, only one side of the political aisle in the United States. Um, so on the bottom left, um, some of you may recall that George W. Bush had a bust of Winston Churchill in the Oval Office. Obama kept the bus, but it got moved into the hall, and then it became a topic of political debate. Does Obama not um, you know, respect Churchill's legacy, et cetera? Um, on the top right as well, you see Kayleigh McEnany, the White House press secretary, 
and she has referred she referred quite recently to President Trump as a uh, church Helene. So as part of the political landscape and the cultural landscape here in the United States. And here's a book that came out recently, Trump and Churchill, Defenders of Western Civilization, with a foreword by the former uh, Republican Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. Okay, so maybe it's just the, the, the sort of political class that are speaking about Churchill, but that's not really the case. So this book here, um, this is this week, number seven in the Amazon charts. So this has been in the top 10 of the Amazon charts for most of the coronavirus. It's a New York Times best-selling book as well. And it's all about, you've guessed it, Churchill, and it focuses in, focuses in particular on the Blitz, which coincidentally actually started to really take off around this month and next month, uh, all those years ago. Okay, so if, the, <laughs> if you haven't read one of the books of the coronavirus, maybe you've played one of the games of the coronavirus, which is Animal Crossing. Um, so uh, I would heartily recommend the book if you get a chance to. Okay, so there's six things that I'm going to suggest that we can learn from Churchill, we can benefit from Churchill as a user of secret intelligence. So Churchill's daughter actually said, you should always be careful about saying what my father would have thought about X or Y event after he died. So he died in 1965, but his legacy is all around us. But with his daughter's advice in mind, I'm nevertheless going to suggest six things that I think that we can learn from Churchill. Okay, so on the right here, you see, uh, or my right, a photograph of Churchill giving his famous V sign. So this is actually in the British Embassy here in Washington, D.C. One of the reasons this is interesting is that one foot is technically in British soil in the embassy, and the other foot is in American soil. So this has a double meaning. One part is that Churchill was a fosterer of the Anglo-American alliance. And one of the most important alliances contained within that was surrounding intelligence. But also, for those of you that don't know, Churchill's mother was actually American. So um, actually from Brooklyn, Jesse Jerome. And on the bottom, Along uh, the left-hand side, you see five flags, and this refers to the Anglo, uh, sorry, the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. So these five countries, um, very close intelligence partners. Um, and I remember when I was in the Air Force, we would quite often get tins, film tins, saying Five Eyes only. Um, this was during the time uh, in the run-up to the Iraq War. Um, but that's friends. But Churchill, quite interestingly, also worked with enemies. So you see him in the top left here with Stalin. So he his anti-communist credentials are almost as impeccable as his anti-Nazi credentials. So he spoke about uh, smothering the Bolshevik infant in its cradle going and, and this is referring back to the early part of the 20th century in Russia but nevertheless during World War II he went into an alliance with Stalin so before that an implacable foe so Operation Barbarossa the German invasion of the Soviet Union Churchill passed on intelligence um, Churchill worked with Stalin and he quite famously said I suspect that if um, Hitler invaded hell, I would have something nice to say about the devil. So Churchill worked with friends, but worked with enemies. So I'm not giving, you know, clean answers. I'm not saying this is, you know, I'm not going to give policy prescriptions here. I'm just saying here are things that Churchill's legacy um, can help us think profitably about. 
So here we see at present um, on the top right, um, China and in the bottom left, Iran. So ostensibly, um, let's just say on the less friendly side um, with the United States and the United Kingdom. But the coronavirus, so you'll see both of the officials wearing masks, the coronavirus doesn't respect national boundaries. The coronavirus doesn't care about where a line is drawn on a map. It doesn't care about what passport you have or about which political identity you have. Um, it's something that's confronting all of humanity. So I guess the question could be, at what point um, do we um, work or, or how much do we work with countries that don't share our values? At what point do we start sharing intelligence? Does it depend on a case by case basis? Um, and so forth. Okay, so number two, we need the swashbucklers and the nerds. Okay, so Churchill was very much a man of action. His whole career, he was a man of action. He was impatient, he was irascible, he always wanted to go where the action was. Um, so in the Second World War and his leadership, the Special Operations Executive, so some of you may have heard the phrase before, he wanted to set Europe ablaze. So when the Nazis had control over continental Europe, he wanted the, the spies, the saboteurs and the, and the swashbucklers to take the war to the enemy on the continent. And this would be by and large a secret war because Britain, of course, at Dunkirk, had retreated its armies from the continent. But on the right here, you see some volumes of Churchill's uh, multi-volume history of World War II. And in that war, as Churchill well knew, the swashbucklers, so the commandos, the intelligence agents, the people going in behind enemy lines, they were part of the story, but another part of the story were the nerds. So the, the brainiacs, the eggheads, the boffins, the people sitting in a study far from the enemy lines. So we see um, on the bottom right here, Enigma. So this was quite important, of course. So one example of a swashbuckler from World War II, um, we see Tommy McPherson here. So um, one of Britain's most decorated um, war heroes. He died um, a few years ago, sadly, but he had many um, interesting escapades um, during the Second World War. One of them, which I think is quite interesting, is that he bluffed 23,000 men of the SS um, Das Reich Division into surrendering to him and it was all a front he was bluffing um, but he got 23,000 men to surrender um, there was a bounty on his head of 300,000 francs and he was called as elusive as the as a scarlet pimpernel and as deadly as a tank and after the war um, or towards the end of the war there was also a price put on his head by the communists so this is this is the type of figure that Churchill loved. He loved the the the, the tales of daring do. But he also understood and saw the advantage of the nerds, for want of a better term, of the brainiacs. So you see here Bletchley Park, um, Alan Turing in the bottom right, and if any of you are um, don't know the story of this action, this day sticker. It comes from an event surrounding Bletchley Park and Turing and the cryptanalysis there. So there was basically having some bureaucratic bottlenecks, and a few of the um, the, the nerds from Bletchley Park took it upon themselves to write to Churchill, and he responded to his um, military um, secretary and said action this day um this has to these people have to get what they need with extreme priority and for the rest of the war um 
this became something that Churchill would use to um, drive people along. Action this day, so something has to happen immediately. So Churchill saw the value of signals intelligence. Um, he saw the value of um, the swashbucklers, but also of the eggheads. Okay. So we see a modern day example here uh, on the bottom left. So after 9-11, uh, into Afghanistan, the CIA were first in. Um, there's a couple of great books on this topic. First in by Gary Schroen, um, Jawbreaker. Um, and on the bottom left here, we see a CIA officer in Afghanistan. I think this is around December 2001. But on the right, we see Cindy Storer, so an analyst in the CIA. So her ability to put pieces of the puzzle together were instrumental in the hunt for Osama bin Laden. So you'll see this is a still taken from the spy museum on the right. So we see that in the modern world, there's a place for both. Okay, and if anybody's interested, this is actually a crossword that um, Bletchley Park used to recruit people. Um, so I think it appeared in the Daily Telegraph in 1942. So if anybody wants to have a go, um, you know, you never know who I might reach out to you afterwards. Um, okay, so the third the third thing I think we can take away from Churchill. So on the left here, you see Room 40. So Room 40 was this legendary room in the old Admiralty building in London. And there were um, analysts there trying to crack the German codes in World War I. So one of the most uh, famous examples of their work was the Zimmerman telegram. So the Zimmerman telegram has been called the most, arguably the most important telegram in American history. And that was instrumental in bringing the United States into World War I. Of course, World War I uh, leads up to World War II, the Cold War and so forth. Um, and on the right hand side, we see the Houses of Parliament and a book about the Joint Intelligence Committee. So by the time we get to World War II, Churchill recognises that the intelligence organisations are not fit for purpose. So Room 40 was very ad hoc. Churchill oversaw it as the first Lord of the Admiralty in World War I. He saw the, values of, the value of signals intelligence. But by World War II, the Joint Intelligence Committee, which was set up in, I think, 1936, was no longer fit for purpose. So within a week, Churchill elevated its status. He made sure that MI5 and MI6, which before were not part of it, were part of it. And he made sure that the Foreign Office could not do an end run around the JIC. So he saw these organizations as having to evolve and having to change depending on the circumstances. So after 9-11, in the top left here, you see the symbol of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. So the 9-11 Commission report looked at how intelligence wasn't shared, um, a lack of coordination, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence was a way to try to um, coordinate all of that. Um, bringing it up to what we're living through at the moment with the coronavirus. Um, you see here one of the coronavirus uh, proteins. We could ask ourselves, um, or, or maybe this is a commission that's going to come in the future, how have the intelligence agencies dealt with coronavirus? Are they still fit for purpose? Um, are there other evolutions or changes that need to happen? Um, we could think about, well, how do we understand intelligence? Are we um, still looking for bombs and tanks and guns and so forth? Not for an invisible enemy 
that doesn't respect national boundaries. So I think that maybe after the coronavirus is over, maybe there will be some taking stock, not necessarily on a 9-11 uh, commission level, but perhaps. Okay, so this is one of my favorites. So think outside of the box, but have someone tell you what the box looks like. So Churchill loved what he called corkscrew thinkers, people that, that were thinking outside of the box, people that were blue skies thinkers, that were um, probing the edges, that were challenging convention. So on the left here, one of my favorite ones is this idea that he was very enthusiastic about, which was turning an iceberg into an aircraft carrier. Um, so very enthusiastic about that for a while. Um, and on the right here, this is, this is from the SOE, another kind of thing that Churchill would have been interested in, um, how to make a rat explode. So putting a primer and a pencil time fuse inside a rat and then using it as a, a time delayed explosive. So Churchill, he loved all of these um, schemes and ideas. Um, but he began to develop a bit of a reputation as, um, as a gambler, as someone that took risks, as someone that was into harebrained schemes, as someone that didn't follow convention. And there's good sides to that, but there's also um, you know, downsides to that as well. So Churchill, early in his career, um, he rose to the top very quickly. Um, he's the first Lord of the Admiralty in World War II. Um, he goes on to be um, take a number, number of other roles, but Gallipoli, the Gallipoli campaign, hangs over him ever afterwards. People would say, "Remember the Dardanelles" as a way of, um, you know, having a go at him. But by World War II, Churchill, I would say, had had recognised that he needed people around him that would keep him um, in guard rails and guide rails. So one of the, the, the most famous examples here is Field Marshal Lord Allenbrook. So his diaries are fantastic. If anybody ever gets a chance, I would strongly recommend them. But he said quite humorously, Winston had 10 ideas every day, only one of which was good, and he did not know which it was. And Allenbrook said that it was his role to try to tell Churchill which one of those ideas was the good one. So it's all very well, I think, being you know a blue skies thinker, but I think that it's also useful to have people that are that are saying, let's think about grand strategy, but let's look at what the box actually looks like as well. Okay, so in the modern era, I think we can see this with in the United States, we can see that this with um, some National Security Council advisors. So on the top left, we see Brzezinski, so Jimmy Carter's National Security Advisor. Um, you know, he would he would constantly give Carter um, feedback and advice based on his reading of, of, of grand strategy, of, of, of the bigger picture of intelligence. Uh, the biggest picture in the frame is Brent Scowcroft, who sadly died just the other week. And he's widely seen as um, one of the major figures that help presidents make sense of the complexity of the international system. And then most recently in the bottom right, you have General McMaster, who served in the current president's um, administration. Okay, number five. So lean into change. So if you look at Churchill's life and career, I mean, we're talking about a period of really profound change. He was born in 1874. He died in 1965. Think about the changes that took place then. Think about training as an old fashioned Victorian cavalry officer and then living to see the atom bomb, Hiroshima, Nagasaki and so forth. But Churchill, unlike a lot of um, the reputation of a lot of British generals, for example, 
moved with the times. He was constantly looking for new technological innovations, new scientific intelligence that could um, you know, prove consequential in future conflict or in world politics. So one, one example I think that we see here is um, Churchill College, Cambridge. So it was set up specifically to have a focus in mathematics, science, and technology. So these were by no manner of means Churchill's strong suits, but he wanted a British MIT. He wanted the Turings of the future. He wanted the problem solvers for problems that hadn't came around yet. So Churchill College, Cambridge has been very successful at this, and I think at the moment it counts 32 Nobel Prize winners. Okay, and finally, um, history is our guide, but not the guide. So I think when we're looking at the big picture, when we're looking at the, the broad flow of history, um, I think that history, it's not perfect. It's very difficult to look at the past and say this gives us clear answers for what's happening just now. But in some ways, it's our only guide. Um, so Churchill was a historian. He was a major historical actor. And he certainly gained a lot of perspective, a lot of grand strategic perspective from studying history. So we could look at the modern day. Um, so on the top left here, you see Soviet columns in Afghanistan. So in 1979, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. Um, interestingly, it goes on to be the longest war in the history of the Soviet Union. So it ends in 1989, just before the dissolution of the Soviet Union. In the bottom right here, you see American soldiers in Afghanistan. So for those of you that don't know, Afghanistan has what went on to displace Vietnam as the longest war in American history. Um, and we see this quote on the bottom left from one of the, the major intelligence historians, Christopher Andrew. Too many leaders suffer from historical attention span deficit disorder. So let's look at an example from Churchill. So families feared the detonations marked the death of those they loved, diplomatists look wise, economists anxious, stupid people mysterious and knowledgeable, all turned to have the noise stopped, but that was a task which could not be accomplished until thousands of lives had been sacrificed and millions of money spent. So this is a book that Churchill wrote in 1898. So this is on his experience up by the, the, what is now the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And he sees how difficult it is to you know, extricate yourself from that region. So Britain had three Anglo-Afghan wars, none of which was um, very successful. In fact, some of them were disasters. Um, so again, it's difficult to always look at the past and look for clear answers, but I think History is one of the only guides that we have. And in terms of anticipatory intelligence about seeing what's coming over the horizon, I think that the study of history is important. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, I think I'm just on time, uh, maybe a minute over. Um, so just to wrap up, we can see this picture from the Spy Museum here um, of George Washington with a face mask. So we're always looking back at historical figures and reinterpreting them anew, at looking at their lives anew, and at looking at the legacy of the past anew. So we've tried to do that today with Churchill. Um, we could do it with Washington. Maybe that will be the title of another talk. Um, this is um, just very recently. So you can see Churchill. Um, a statue of Churchill, a very famous one across from the House of Parliament, was um, graffitied recently. Um, and this was a big topic of debate uh, back home in the UK. Um, 
And then I actually re-watched the Imitation Game recently. I don't know um, if you've all seen it, but if not, I would strongly recommend it. So this is Benedict Cumberbatch playing Alan Turing. And I noticed that at the beginning, he was wearing this mask. And it had nothing to do with the coronavirus. But I think that this is a good example of the way that we constantly look at stuff with the, the eyes of the present. So before, when I watched this movie, I never thought anything of the mask. Now, that looks like most people walking around the street. Um, thanks a lot for your time. I look forward to spending more of these events with you. And uh, back to Amanda. Hi, Andrew. Nice job. Lots of appreciation in the question and answer. And we've got some glorious softball questions. And we okay. have some That's tough okay. questions. So I'm going to change it up nonstop. But I'll, I'll start with the tough one because you passed by at the end the, the statue of, of Churchill with the comment that he was a racist. Could you mention just a little bit bit more about that. That's certainly on everyone's minds, um, you know, here in the States and all over the world. Okay. Um, so this is obviously a huge question, and it's one that historians are arguing about a lot at the moment. Um, to what extent, you know, looking back on figures from the past, is it fair to apply cor current mores and current standards? And this is a bigger question that I'm not go that I'm not going to be able to answer. In fact, nobody's able to answer. It's a debate. Um, so there were certainly people back home who were in favour of a lot of um, political developments that were happening. So I could give you one example. The university in my home city of Glasgow, they had a they had a, a, a report recently that looked at the legacy of slavery um, and the endowment and in the building of the university. Um, they authored a report and, you know, uh, other universities in the UK were encouraged and have began to do similar things. But other people said, well, putting graffiti on a Churchill statue is going too far. Um, he, he was responsible for helping to defeat one of the most racist and most uh, xenophobic and anti-Semitic um, entities that's ever existed. So there's a big debate surrounding uh, Churchill. Um, there's an interesting article and video by Andrew Roberts. So he's, he's written on Churchill. If anybody wants to explore this a little bit more, I would encourage you just to have a look around the internet and in the Washington Post, I think it was just the other week, there was also an article looking at the dark side of Churchill's legacy. Yeah. So yeah. there's a debate about, you know, Churchill's legacy. There's different positions within that debate, and I, I don't really want to, um, you know, say that I have the answer to that. I think it's no, just. A, no. it's, it's just it's it's interesting. We're all focusing. I mean, from sports teams to historians uh it's really it is um it's an a great time and we hope we'll see some changes and so now i'll give you some easy ones okay, um, okay. these are these are gonna we're gonna have a little spate of drinking ones and i know you know these um what was the quintessential cocktail preferred by Winston Churchill at, at uh, Chartwell? Okay. Um, I mean, to me, there's, the, there's a number of drinks that Churchill loves. You know, he loves brandy. He loves champagne. There's even a, a, a type of champagne by Paul Roger, Paul Roger, uh, Winston Churchill. I think that at the time, Champagne had more Pinot Noir in it, so it was a bit darker. So the Paul mm. Rod Winston Churchill, I believe, has is a little a little darker of a champagne. Um, he liked martinis. Um, you know, his idea of a martini was uh, you get ice cold gin and you go mm. hi France or hi Italy, and then you drink it. So that was his version of getting some vermouth. Um, yeah. But to me, the quintessential. My 
No, so they, my dad used to, my dad was was a big just just wave the vermouth bottle over the glass like not even <laughs> open it so uh, but for me, the quintessential Churchill drink is, it's pretty simple. It's a scotch and soda. Um, he, he, he loved his scotch. Um, he loved, you know, uh, whiskey. Um, he wouldn't, um, surprisingly, you know, just drink lots of neat whiskey. He would have it with soda water. He would have it when he woke up. He would imbibe it throughout the day. So that is probably the, you know... This is Potentially another lesson for us during the times of COVID. Just we just get up and we just start with the scotch and soda. I mean, he was very productive. It never seemed to get in the way of his productivity. It, the, it might explain the ten ideas, but only good one. You know, <laughs> um, someone wants to know why did he like Johnny Walker Red instead of blue or green? Um, I, I'm not specifically. Um, sure on that. I feel like the blue and the green are more recent phenomenons. That's, that's what I thought. I, I'm not sure either, but that was my gut. I thought you might know. All right, last drink question, just to get get them out of the way. They're very cool. They came in early on. Um, we've talked about what Churchill liked to drink. Do you know what uh, Stalin liked to drink? I believe it was vodka. I believe it was vodka. Yeah. yeah. Um, that one I'm not completely sure about. I think that's an incredibly good and safe guess. <laughs> so, um, this is a um, very cool question. Given your experience seeing intelligence photography ahead of the Gulf War, should Western leaders have known there were no WMDs in Iraq? Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the you know the Gulf War is usually used to refer to the earlier war, so nineteen ninety one, the Persian Gulf War. Um mm -hmm. but the the, the, the two thousand and three war, um should they have known? Um I think that looking back now, I think that there's definitely a strong argument to be made that that a lot of the intelligence or, or was fitted around the policy um, and there were there were certainly gaps there um, back home in the UK I used to teach this course called Britain and the War on Terror and we spent about three weeks looking at the various uh, inquiries and commissions into the Iraq war and the and the intelligence case and so forth so should they have they have known um, I mean uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess it. I guess, I guess it. I guess it depends on, you know, your threshold of what should be necessary to go to war. So many people would say that the threshold to go to war should be extremely high, and I think that if it is very high, then the the intelligence there, looking back from a present vantage point, probably wasn't enough to go to war. Um, but should they have known? I mean, I mean, sure, everybody would like to know the future, but intelligence is, you know, not not clairvoyance. Um, so this was interesting. One person asked to know what was in the Zimmerman telegram, and someone else wrote that they um they teach it in Texas, which was kind of cool. So I wanted to I almost wanted to hook up those those two participants, but I thought maybe you should tell everyone in a in a brief statement. Okay, so in a, in a nutshell, Britain was um, involved in um, cracking uh, German codes and involved in siphoning off intelligence that went and um, sea underground sea cables, um, but. One of the problems is that with intelligence, quite often you want to keep your tricks a secret. So at what point do you tilt your cards and show people um, what's going on? But basically Britain intercepted a telegram that was saying that if Mexico um, joined Germany in World War I, then you know Germany 
would support Mexico and the, Britain realised that this was, um, you know, politically important. Um, so basically, they, um, yeah, they they, they weaponised that they utilised that, um, and then of course the United States came into World War One. Thank you. Cool summary. Our uh, our our second historian, Thomas Bogart, has a very nice book that he wrote about the Zimmerman telegram. So it's always dear to my heart because of his research. Um, this is a cool question. My father was in the OSS in Yugoslavia from 1943 to 45. I wonder if he worked with Sterling Hayden. What was the influence of Randolph Churchill on the shift of resources from the Chetniks, the US partner, to Tito and the Russians? Uh, of R Randolph Churchill. That's what they say in the question. Yeah, um, I mean, my my knowledge of R Randolph Churchill. Um, I mean, I've, I've I've read several biographies of Churchill, and and, and the, the the famous one by Sir Martin Gilbert, the the sort of multi-volume one. Mm -hmm. um, and Randolph Churchill generally comes across as a sort of ineffectual kind of. Um, wasteful son who has gambling debts, who drinks too much, who, you know, is a little bit of a of a pain in the butt for his father. So my the, to the best of my recollection, I don't remember Randolph Churchill being particularly um influential there, but I could be wrong. And if the listener knows something that I don't, I would love to hear. Um Oh, this is this is very interesting. Um, what was Churchill's experience of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic? Okay, this is this is a good one actually. So Churchill um, managed to avoid it, but his wife got the flu. Um, his daughter uh, got the flu. His young baby, um, Marigold pardon me if I remember, got the flu. She actually lived, she, she survived the flu, but she later died of septicemia. Um, and another interesting thing about the political context of that time, so Churchill was in government for a while, but in the United States, uh, Woodrow Wilson got the flu. And I think that for a while it was touch and go. And also Franklin Delano Roosevelt, so, one of Churchill's interlocutors, or one of his like um, the people that he dealt with in World War One, um, and then of course would later, you know, be an ally with in World War Two. He also got the flu, so Churchill managed to dodge it, but it did affect his family. And if I remember correctly, he actually never went back to his family home to try to avoid getting the flu. Oh. So Clementine. His wife got it, his baby got it, and many other people got it, but Churchill managed to avoid it. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes we have to just, you know, separate ourselves from our families. <laughs> um, someone wants to know, how, how do you feel about the portrayal of Churchill in The Crown, the uh, television series? And The Crown, actually, it's one of the few series I haven't seen. Um, I've seen most things on uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime, yeah. um, but that's one of the things I haven't seen. So apologies. No, no, very good, very good. Um, and someone wants to know, what do you think is Churchill's biggest intelligence triumph and perhaps biggest failure? Just a tiny question there. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I think s s some of his failures would probably. I mean, there's there's Gallipoli, there's um, you know his his support for you know the soft underbelly of Europe, you know the Balkans, Italy. I think that he was a little bit off in terms of his grand strategy. Um, so there, there are certainly problems there, and if you, you, if you have an entire career at the summit of of politics, then there's, you know, I'm not making excuses for them, but there's, there's going to be baggage, um, 
you know, he spent a whole lifetime in politics. Um, success, I, th I think it would just be that if you look back on his career, right from World War I up to World War II, he sees the value of SIGIN, so signals intelligence, and that pays dividends in World War I and in World War II. So I wouldn't say it was one specific thing. Here was this mm -hmm. one piece of intelligence and he made this decision. But SIGIN, I think, was 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 absolutely central um, and very important. Yeah, someone said that they understood that young Brigadier General um, Eisenhower got his liking of intelligence from Churchill very early in World War II, um, and that this led to U.S. Um, working with and on intelligence agencies during his presidency. Any thoughts on that? Um, so, I mean, I think that, uh, so the, the one of the people that are referenced in the presentation, so um, Lord Alan Brooke, so he was the, he was like the British George C. Marshall. He was like the, you know, the president's grand strategist and he, in those diaries, he has a lot of thoughts on Eisenhower um, and a lot of thoughts on Churchill and everyone else. Um, they really are a great insight into the Second World War. If anybody you know, is looking for a different take, I would, I would strongly recommend that. Um, and in those diaries, uh, Eisenhower is certainly involved and around there, but it's a while since I've read an Eisenhower uh, biography, so I can't, I can't specifically remember you know, a, a specific meeting or whatever when when you know this happened, but it certainly sounds like it certainly sounds uh, you know plausible. Yeah. Now here's something that I I think any of us who are interested in intelligence wonder about when you say you have to you have to buddy up with Stalin. It's it's important, it's useful. How do you swallow some of the intelligence that you, of, of what they're actually doing, massacres, things like that, that don't become public for decades perhaps, but you have to live with it. How do you, how do you think Churchill kind of, was he a compartmentalizer? Was, was he, how did, how did he handle that sort of thing? Okay. Um... I, th I think for Churchill, um, it was just pragmatic. It was just like the example that I gave. He said that if Hitler invaded hell, he would probably have something nice to say about the devil. So it was just, you know, if you think of Britain's predicament in 1940, um, France out, Italy, uh, and against the United Kingdom, America not yet in the war, the Soviet Union had not yet been invaded. Um, things were not looking good. Uh, the Battle of Britain, the Blitz, the Battle of the Atlantic, things were not looking good. So I think that um, Churchill saw that the writing was on the wall and decided that he was going to go into an alliance with Stalin. And I, again, just to reiterate, Churchill was no fan of communism at right. all. Um, he was a, a, an ardent anti-communist. All right, there are so many questions and we are gonna share them with you afterward. I, I wanted, yeah. this one's so cool. With the current focus on what constitutes fake news, I wonder if you could comment on Churchill's wartime statement that truth needed to be accommodated, accompanied by a bodyguard of lies. What an interesting thing to throw out there. Okay, <laughs> okay, that's a good question. Um, these are really smart people that listen to these programs, right? I'm not, yeah, I'm not, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that if we think about the D-Day operation. So, you know, Churchill wanted that shrouded in a, you know, a bodyguard of lies because the truth was dangerous. If the if the Nazis knew where the beaches that the, the Allies were going to land on, that was that was very dangerous for the whole outcome of the war. So it had to be 
enshrouded in a bodyguard of lies. In peacetime, there are some arguments that governments lie because they need to, because it's, you know, because that's just what politicians have to do. You know, like that, that joke, how do you know when a politician's lying? Well, they're moving their lips. Um, you know, you could, <laughs> you could you, some people have that understanding. Other people think that, so somebody like Jimmy Carter, when he came to office, he said, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go to war uh, and I'm always going to tell the truth. So he came in saying, I'm always going to tell the truth. There's different, you know, different points of view on, it depends on how cynical you are about politicians and about the political system. Some people say that some lying is necessary. Jimmy Carter said, I will never lie to you. Um, you know, it depends on, it depends on your view of politics, I guess. Well, I don't have to lie to say that it is really great getting to know you. I'm awfully glad that we've had, had a long process in bringing you aboard because that means I actually got to met, meet you in person before um, we all um, had to take to our homes. Although the Spy Museum is open um, and welcomes your visits. Andrew, you were fantastic. It was so interesting. Um, I want to thank Jasmine from Free State for mixing up that glorious drink. I think I might need to make a trip down there and try that. And um, I want to ask, I have a very exciting announcement. Um, the Spy Museum has a really wonderful, generous, anonymous donor who is willing to match any contributions that are made now and double them. And we have until the end of the year, but of course, the sooner that comes in, the better. So anything that you give tonight is gonna to be doubled and you don't have to give only once. You could give tonight and you can give after our next program on September 17th, which is Spy Chat with Chris Costa and Mary Beth Long. But don't feel any pressure, but you know, it'd be lovely if you gave a donation. I think Andrew and I would drink to that. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Stay well and cheers. Stay safe, thank you. Thank you.